Many know George Foreman from his iconic loss to Muhammad Ali, or from his stellar salesmanship of a certain grill. But when the name Foreman is spoken, the image that should enter into everyone's mind is that of the most terrifying knockout artist to ever live. An unstoppable behemoth lumbering forward, so incredibly powerful just a touch could send men flying across the ring. A man so brutal, yet so savvy, that he could take back his championship at the age of 45, 20 years after losing it. In a sport where most athletes age like milk left out in the Texas sun, George Foreman seemed to age like a fine bottle of wine. But regardless of which era you fought on him, his 89% KO rate meant you were probably getting flattened like a sheet of paper. Foreman's original style was already pure insanity from a conventional standpoint. How he altered it to carve a path forward deep into his 40s is one of the most surprising and innovative transformations in boxing history. After a decades-long break, Foreman added the rare, bordering on mythical, crossguard and other know-how into his old-school repertoire. A big reason he was able to capture the world title in two distinct eras. By the way, let me know in the comments who you think would have won if he'd faced Tyson. Today, we're going to look at two breakdowns in one video, locking down the iconic styles and tactics of young George Foreman and <clears throat> seasoned George Foreman. Big George took up boxing at 17 and quickly became a top amateur winning multiple tournaments and eventually earning a place in the Olympics. After taking the gold medal, Foreman's self-professed proudest moment, he turned pro in 1969, storming the professional ranks with furious, fight-ending ferocity, cutting down most of his opponents within a few rounds, using ingenious tactics that were last in vogue 70 years earlier. Young George Foreman, unlike the jovial man we know today, was an imposing figure and a nightmare scenario for most heavyweights standing across from him, subjected to his icy stare. It was his highlight reel knockouts that grabbed the headline, but it was his unusual old school defense that set up these terrifying knockouts. Foreman implied what's known as a long guard as his primary defense. Hence why Muhammad Ali dubbed him the mummy. With his guard loose, he was very effective. With his arms extended, he could control his opponents, pushing and prodding them, smothering their offense, trapping them in their own guard. Like a wrestler, Foreman would look for points of contact, trying to touch his opponent's head, shoulders, arms, or gloves. Once he touched them, he had control. Some of these skills he actually learned from a judo practitioner, and the pairing of grappling and power blows worked perfectly for the big man. All of these tactics helped him set up his shots, either by nullifying their offense so he was safe to rattle off punches, or stifling their guard as if he were trying to hold a door shut. Pinning the arm meant the opponent couldn't counter with it or use it to help defend their other side. Or by shoving them off balance, bullying them into positions where he could better line up his shots, like pushing a pedestrian into oncoming traffic. Foreman didn't just expertly cut off the ring, he bulldozed competitors into the ropes. You never knew if a punch or a push was coming but either one would pin you into the corner. Using the long guard, a guard far more common in Muay Thai, was a big gamble. But when the cards were down, Foreman always had the intuition to bet on the right hand. That wasn't the only way that his defense conveniently helped his offense. His looser guard made his punches highly unpredictable because they could come from anywhere rather than one consistent guard position. Even worse for competitors, Foreman's punches looped like curveballs, and it only took one strike from Big George before they were out. The way he threw punches was actually what had most concerned Ali about fighting Foreman. It was hard to anticipate what punch was heading your way because it would morph into a different strike with the new target midway through. But even with his hands down, Foreman had no fear of his opponent's big haymakers. 
he would simply extend his arms to long block, taking the inside track to derail their shots until they ran out of steam. Then it was his turn. This was made all the easier if he had already established that point of contact. Or he would have his hands so in their face that he could stop the punches just as they were getting started. It goes without saying, this must have been a frustrating, blinding experience for Foreman's competitors. Even the keenest opposition had trouble seeing through leather. If opponents managed to get through all of these defenses, then Foreman was surprisingly agile for such a big man. His footwork and head movement was his last line of defense, and it must have felt demoralizing to suddenly get through this awkward, lumbering fighter's insane guard and realize that he was actually fast as lightning when he wanted to be. It's funny, but fascinating to see him dance around the ring during this exhibition fight, where he took on five men in one night. Ali was in the crowd, and I can't help but thinking he was taunting him, or at least saying, you think this is hard? I could do this too. But maybe the greatest weapon in Foreman's arsenal was his jab, forged and refined by his time sparring boxing champion Sonny Liston, a master of the heavy jab. Liston, a man with hands the size of most men's biceps, loved to set up his power shots by pounding the opponent with battering ram leads. But the greatest trick to Liston's jab that Foreman adopted was leaving it out there to lean his weight on his opponents. The true definition of a heavy jab. Another overpowered tactic he maybe picked up from Liston was to use the jab to bait head movement. He could trick them into moving their heads directly into his next punch. And this would not be a jab. A fantastic example of this is his title winning effort against Joe Frazier, where Foreman jabbed to take advantage of Frazier's tendency to duck, then made him pay with a stout uppercut. Foreman went 40-0 defending the title multiple times before his historic defeat by Muhammad Ali. A major setback that meant he'd need to work hard to get back to the belt. But after a loss to Jimmy Young and a post-fight near-death experience in 1977, Foreman retired to become a minister. And for most athletes, that would be it. But not Foreman. To the shock of boxing pundits and the public at large, Big George Foreman mounted a comeback in 1987. After a decade away from the ring, most expected a diminished version of the hulking 70s heavyweight. Instead, they got George Foreman 2.0, more of a well-rounded elder statesman, thanks to an honest assessment of his remaining strengths and new weaknesses. Like an old kung fu master who can dodge a million blows by barely moving, anticipating every attack before it's thrown, Foreman proved that experience can sometimes make up for athleticism. Besides, he still had his power, and more importantly, his mind. He also brought back the legendary Archie Moore, a man with 134 knockouts. Just like Liston, Foreman became an incredible student and mastered Moore's signature crossguard style. George was smart enough to know he couldn't defeat Father Time, but by remaking his style, he could outlast and outsmart his much younger competition. While age had taken away some of Foreman's speed and reflexes, he still had his strength, and the crossguard allowed him to tank through damage. One of the most dangerous moments for a boxer is right after they punch, before they can pull their hand back to their guard. This may have been a big problem for Foreman since he had slowed with age, but the cross guard system allowed him to turn his punch right into a cross block. Getting rid of that vulnerable moment in time by closing the defensive gap immediately. Foreman's brother Roy, a trainer himself, Notice that George had always had trouble with defending right hands after he jabbed. George's cross guard helped with this, as well as a high elbow block. Plus, throwing up twin cross blocks created a quick, low effort shield that would deflect the majority of his opponent's shots. It was a catch-all strategy that was guaranteed to at least partially negate most punches, while conserving his stamina for his offense. This way, Foreman didn't need the reflexive parries and head movement of his youth, or the ability to follow his opponent's lateral movement and keep aligned with them. He was safe in his fortress until he was ready to fire off the cannons. But this was only the simplest strategy. The cross guard is not foolproof, as Foreman proves here by immediately targeting the openings in his opponent's cross guard. 
but Big George still had his old tricks to help him out. When it came to the crossguard and his older tactics, it wasn't an either-or situation. He was excellent at melding the longguard and the crossguard into a system. He would use his longguard to establish contact, then collapse into his crossguard as he pressed in. This resulted in the potential for complete control as he moved through every range. Conversely, he could use his old grappling tactics from his crossguard, repositioning opponents by crossframing, once again setting them up for punches. Foreman could bully from long range with his long guard. In fact, this resulted in one of the strangest knockdowns ever. George long blocked a hook, then looked to turn it into a frame. But the force of the punch knocked Foreman's palm into his opponent's temple, sending him toppling to the canvas. While in close range, Foreman could bully equally well with his crossguard, using very similar tactics to Roberto Duran to clear space for punches. Here Foreman uses a cross trap to make way for a rear hook. Here Foreman pulls down his opponent's guard to hook, then pins it to set up another hook. And since Foreman loved body shots, this was just one more way for him to grill and batter his opponent's ribs. You can check out my book Aggressive Defense for even more cross guard and long guard tactics and how to combine them. Foreman's offense also got an upgrade. Replacing explosiveness with his veteran savvy, he became even craftier with his power punches. Mixing signature haymakers with far more compact power shots. Explaining that going wide then tightening up the shots confused his competitors to no end. It was a natural way to deviate the tempo and angles of his combinations. So opponents had to worry about defending varying rhythms, angles, impact, and multiple targets against one of the hardest punchers in history, knowing that if they lost, it was to a man decades older than them. It could not have been a fun experience, but it had little to do with them and more about how rare and exceptional a fighter George Foreman is. Foreman still remains the oldest heavyweight champion of all time, and the biggest lesson his achievement can teach us is one of balance. Big George believed in himself even when others didn't, but he was not so overconfident that he believed himself the same fighter with the same physical attributes he had enjoyed as a young man. Only because his ambition was paired with acceptance of his new limitations, because he was able to introspect and go into deep study, working hard to learn new skills, capitalizing on his new strengths while limiting his old, could he make his impossible dream a reality. And in so doing, become an inspiration for generations to come. From the Modern Martial Artist, this has been David Christian, wishing you happy training.